My name is Amata, and in this Red Gamer Tech video, I'm here with the latest from the tech world and a little bit of spice from the gaming world in the last 24 or so hours. So, what I have for you today? Well, we're going to kick things off with some comments from the PlayStation boss who says that the PS4 is entering the last of its life. Then we're going to move over to how the fact that another variant of Spectre, the fourth variant, has been discovered. Then we're going to move over to the AMD B450 mid-range chipset, and then we're going to finish things up with a QLC NAND memory that has been launched by Intel and Micron. But as I said, we're going to kick things off with PlayStation. Now, of course, we've had a lot of speculations, leaks, and rumours about the specifications of the as-yet-unconfirmed PlayStation 5. If you haven't seen Paul's video on the rumours that we had yesterday, I would highly recommend you check them out, as it is quite interesting. But we're here to talk about the PS4. Now, of course, this console has been on an absolute tear since it launched in 2013. It has sold twice as many units, or might have sold twice as many units, should I say, because, of course, we have never really gotten the solid facts and figures from Microsoft. But regardless of how it's done versus a competitor, it has sold an absolute ton of units. But, of course, as you might expect, sales are starting to slow down. Now, the PlayStation boss, a fellow by the name of John Codera, did announce during Sony's corporate strategy meeting that the console is entering the end of its life cycle. Now, of course, that doesn't mean, you know, they're packing up everything tomorrow, that's it, the last PS4 has been sold. Obviously, that's a bit silly. It's saying it's entering the end of its life cycle, which could mean a year or maybe even two, because, of course, we know how everything slow moves when it comes to big corporations. And, of course, the last console generation went on for arguably too long, so we're kind of used to consoles obviously having long life cycles and if, given that we just had the PS4 Pro released not too long ago, not really in the big scheme of things, obviously they've got that in mind as well. Now we have some tweets from Takahashi Mochizuki of the Wall Street Journal and he reported some of what Kodera had to say on Twitter. So we're just going to go through these various tweets and the first thing that he discussed was that Kodera said that we can expect more exclusive titles for PlayStation platforms. Now, if you ask me, this is one of the areas where PlayStation is quite strong. Obviously, this is a very personal, subjective thing because, you know, what I find interesting is a game you might look at and go, ugh, ugh really? So obviously that's a very personal thing, but in my personal opinion, the PS4 has had pretty strong exclusive lineup. So unsurprisingly, they're expecting to increase that strength. Now, they also did touch on the PlayStation VR, which, of course, hasn't really been in the headlines that much. You know, the, as much as I'm interested in virtual reality, the current headsets on the market have yet to really take things by storm. They've yet to really change the industry in the way that I think VR has the potential to. And according to Takahashi, Kodera said, quote, PSVR growing, but industry's growth is below market expectations. PlayStation VU is facing harder than expected competitions. VU and PSVR would aim for future growth with realistic outlook. But the TLDR of all of this is basically, yes, the PlayStation 4 is entering the end of its life. But that doesn't mean, again, that it's coming you know, out of stock tomorrow. It just means that, okay, they're kind of preparing to wind down the console. There's probably a couple of years, at least, given that the current rumours, at least, for the PlayStation 5 are 2019 or 2020. I would say late 2019 is pretty reasonable, but I would expect around 2020 for the PlayStation 5, if that's even what it's called, of course. And that would kind of line up with what he said, like a couple of years would put it, of course, at 2020, which I think would make complete sense, not only in terms of what we already know in terms of the rumours, but in what he already said and what we're kind of expecting from how much mileage developers are going to be able to get out the technology in the PS4 and, of course, the PS4 Pro. But with all that said, let's move on to our next topic, which is regarding, unfortunately, yet another Spectre variants. So what we have here is Speculative Store Bypass Variant 2. Now this does affect Intel, AMD and ARM, so equal opportunity employer this particular vulnerability. And it's focused more towards targeting web browsing components which are not meant to be accessed by your everyday applications. Now, I do have a bit of a statement here from Intel regarding SSB Variant 4, which says it, quote, target systems with microprocessors utilizing speculative execution and speculative execution of memory reads before the addresses of all prior memory writes are known may allow unauthorized disclosure of information to an attacker with local user access via a side channel analysis. Now, one of the things that Intel also stressed that they have seen no evidence that there are any reports of this method actually being used in real world exploits. But they went on further to say about variant 4, quote, like the other GPZ variants, variant 4 uses speculative execution 
feature common to most modern processor architectures to potentially expose certain kinds of data through a side channel. In this case, the research has demonstrated Variant 4 in a language-based runtime environment. While we are not aware of a successful browser exploit, the most common use of runtimes like JavaScript is in web browsers. However, there is good news, thankfully, and that they have already delivered microcode update for Variant 4 in beta form to OEM system manufacturers and, of course, software vendors. So we can basically expect it to see being released into production BIOS and software updates over the next coming weeks. However, Intel do stress, quote, this mitigation will be set to off by default, providing customers the choice of whether to enable it. We expect most industry software partners will likewise use the default option. In this configuration, we have observed no performance impact. If enabled, we've observed a performance impact of approximately 2 to 8% based on overall scores for benchmarks like Sysmark, 2014 SE and spec integer rate on client and server test systems. So basically, if it's off like it is by default, there's no performance impact, but if you turn it on, you can expect one of about 2 to 8%. Now, 8%, of course, it does matter, especially if you're not getting, like, you know, 10 out of 10 performance as it is. But at least they have kind of said, hey, you can expect to see some performance impact of this being enabled. Now, they have also said that the update does also include microcode that addresses variant 3, which was previously documented by ARM back in January. Now, thankfully, there's no meaningful performance impact on client or server benchmarks with the Variant 3 mitigation. So, you know, one upside, I guess, kind of. But the TLDR of all of that, basically, is that this is just, again, another variant on Spectre that this time is, as I've already said, targeting web-based applications. But Intel already on the case, but as I said, it does also target, or can also be targeted towards, I guess I should say, towards AMD and ARM as well. So not brilliant, I'm sure we all wish this whole Spectre meltdown thing would just be put to bed already and there wouldn't be a new Spectre variant raising its ugly head every week, but hey-ho, until that happens, unfortunately, then we're probably going to be talking about this for some time. And of course, the fallout from the initial reveal of Spectre and how Intel might have known about it, and obviously the comments from the US government that I discussed ages ago now actually, have yet to really be felt, but of course... As always, I will keep you guys apprised. But let's move on to the AMD B450. So basically what we have here is the second 400 series motherboard chipset. It is slated for a second half of 2018 release alongside the Ryzen 5 2500X along with some other entry level second generation Zen processors. Now of course this comes with the support for the Ryzen 2000 series but it also has the same numbers of USB, SATA and PCI links as we saw in the B350. And of course we do see overclocking support retained just like we saw again in the B350. But what improvements do we see? Well we see a reduced idle power draw of less than 2 watts. And we do also see the same enhanced CPU, VRM and memory routing specifications that we saw back in the X470. Now, what also might tickle your fancy is that the B450 does actually support NVMe RAID, which, as you might recall, was exclusive to the X399 in the previous generation. But the last thing I kind of want to touch on here is something a bit mysterious by the name of XFR 2.0 Enhanced. Now, we had, did also see this on the X470 as well, but at the moment, at least as far as I can dig up, there's no tech document that tells us what this even is or how it's different from XFR 2.0, which is was also present on this particular table. But with all that said, let's finish up with our final topic of today, which as I said, is regarding Intel and Micron's QLC NAND memory. So basically what we have here is that Intel has announced they're ready to start shipping the first 4-bit cell 3D NAND dies. The increase in density allows for one terabit of memory per die and at the moment at least, is the most capacity dense flash memory produced. However, in terms of the QLC, the, the new QLC provides a 33% higher density compared to TLC, 3 bits a cell, and the offering from Intel and Micron's QLC does utilize 64 layers of second gen 3D NAND. But we also had a little bit about what they're hoping to do for the future. As Intel and Micron are aiming to increase the number of layers to 96 in the third generation of NAND memory, but they are going to stick with TLC for the first attempts at further vertical stacking. But I do also have a bit of a statement here from Intel Vice President saying, quote, 
Commercialization of 1TB 4-bit cell is a big milestone in MVM history and is made possible by numerous innovations in technology and design that further extend the capability of our floating gate 3D NAND technology. But you might be going, okay, this is all great, it's all pretty, you're sure saying a lot of words and all, but what does this actually mean for me, the consumer? Well, as you might expect, it's going to be cloud and data centers that really see the full benefit of this. However, you and I are going to see some benefit from this for, you know, for example, you know, the cost savings from the increase in density will ultimately lead to high capacity drives and slightly lower pricing. But obviously this is going to take some time for it to drip down to us, but eventually we will see that reduction in price, but of course the improvements in the higher capacity as well. But as I said before, even if it's not intended for the average consumer, I do still love reading and uh, talking about stuff like this because it's just cool seeing technology increase, you know, how we have come so far with even something as quote-unquote boring as memory, and I don't find memory boring at all, to be honest, but it's not as flashy as, say, a graphics card, just for instance. But that is me done for this video. Do forgive my slightly croaky voice. Unfortunately, I am getting over a cold at the moment, as you've probably been able to tell. Getting there, but... Uh, not 100%, not my usual sparkling stuff, as you might be able to tell. But regardless, I'm going to be done for this video. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.